Good afternoon and uh, thank you for joining us today for this webinar about five common mistakes to avoid when building a disaster recovery plan. Uh, my name is Lee Dalton, I'm the Vendor Relationship Manager here at Forces uh, and I'm also the uh, Internal Quorum Specialist. Um, joining me today we've got uh, Gabe Gambill from Quorum. Quorum is uh, a partner of Forces and an innovative vendor within the disaster recovery space. Uh, and Gabe is the VP of Product Management and Technical Infrastructure. Uh, he's been working in IT for over 20 years now and specifically with Quorum for the last six uh, where he has uh, a wealth of experience um, focused around DR um, across uh, operations in Europe and the rest of the world. So uh, today's session uh, we're going to cover five of the most common pitfalls in the average disaster recovery strategy and how Quorum and the OnQ solution uh, can help you avoid those. Um, Obviously, there is a questions box in the bottom right-hand corner of the, uh, the GoToWebinar uh, section there. And if you'd like to pop any questions into that uh, on the way through, if you think of anything, and what we'll do is we'll do a Q&A session at the end um, where uh, we can go through those and cover all of those off for you. So uh, at this point, really, it's just over uh, to hand over to Gabe, who's going to be taking you through the remainder of this webinar, and I will jump back in towards the end to go through the Q&A session. So uh, over to you, Gabe. Thanks a lot, Lee. I hope everybody can hear me okay. Uh, as Lee pointed out, I've been with Quorum for about six years, and uh, before that I worked with a managed service provider and security provider in the U.S. Uh, specializing in community banks. So I've done countless disaster recovery plans, BCP plans, audits, and so forth in the arena. Um, and so when I came over to Quorum, it was a natural transition for me into this marketplace. Um, first slide I want to take you through is just kind of what we're going to cover today. We're going to cover those top five mistakes and, and really to wrap it up very simply, um, overcomplicated solutions, um, production systems and storage backups as the target, you know, using your SAN to be your backup point, uh, partial virtual server full site recoveries. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the uh, partial versus full site and then mixing production and vendors and scalability limitations. So this is kind of how backups have evolved over time. And uh, forgive me if I leave some of the uh, more corner cases out of this, but really in the beginning you had tape backups um, and all of your data basically was put on tapes. And then uh, when we got a little more complicated and a little more advanced, uh, we stopped putting them in the trunk of our cars and had services come pick them up and store them off site. Um, and then as, as the cloud started to evolve and disk, bit, disk prices started to drop, we had disk space recovery and, and cloud recovery solutions. Um, and all of these things were, were great for archiving data and long-term retention, but when you needed to get a server, an application uh, up and running, um, it was a challenge. You know, especially if you had tapes off-site and you were requesting to bring them back, um, it was a very significant point of pain for not only you, but for your customers, for your users. And so we've, we've evolved, especially with the advent of virtualization um, and cloud applications like uh, putting stuff up in Azure or in AWS to have local high availability and offsite disaster recovery. Um, and that's kind of what, what Quorum has entered the market to do is basically offer that high hyper-converged backup solution so that not only are you recovering the data that you need, but you can actually bring those applications up and run them. And we'll go into all those details as we go through this today. So what's the goal? Well, for most IT departments, the goal is really to get back to a normal working uh, system as fast as humanly possible. And so you take all that and you say, right, well then if I just replicate everything from one system to another, I'll do that as fast as humanly possible. But then it becomes in a scale of economics. Not everybody can afford to have a dual production environment. So we have to be more innovative. We have to come up with ways with which to manage and recover these items um, in, in, a, in a reasonable amount of time, but remain uh, plugged into the needs of our users. And so whether you're running on a virtual platform, a physical platform, um, obviously most customers now have NASs and they have uh, file storage outside of the server architecture. You're running cloud to recover an application swiftly. Um, that should be your goal in your HA 
your DR and your um, your BCP recovery planning. And so maintaining that uptime, recovering from that uptime, of course, the ability to quickly restore individual files um, is 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 critical because most of our most of our recovery needs are for an individual file versus for a entire server but we have to plan for everything and we have to be able to recover those servers because the last thing you need is three days of downtime while you wait for a tape to get shipped back. So the first mistake is an overly complicated solution and I see this in more customers than they're willing to admit. Um, what, I, what I find is, is the really good IT people, the really solid teams, the guys that are smart, they know how to work their SAN, they know how to do their networking, they are very intelligent, innovative people. What they do is they overcomplicate their solution, thinking that they're going to be the ones that are going to be able to recover it. But those really smart people tend to, A, be promoted or move around, but B, they tend to actually have a life and want to be able to go home or go on vacation. And so when they're not there, if a disaster happens, everything seems to fall apart because only one person ends up knowing how to do the whole recovery plan to get things back up and running. And so when I, when I see customers do this um, and make these overly complicated solutions, the first thing I say is, can your boss recover this? Which is always a, a weird question and they're taken aback by it. But usually the management level is not as plugged into the technical details of how things happen. And so if they can't do it without you, um, you're setting yourself up for either being a single point of failure or being relied on to be available 24 by 7, which isn't fair to the IT person. All for an overly complicated solution that is going to take you more time than you had planned to recover from. So, so as we look at the the left side of the screen here, you'll see my overly complicated diagram, but the right side is our desk and it has all the tape backups and, and the IT passwords and the guys, you know, obviously running around, he's never at his desk. Um, in, in the second mistake people make, what they do is they tend to try to say, well, my SANS takes snapshots, so I can just recover it right back from the SAN. Um, this is probably the most common mistake I see bar none because snapshots have this great ability to snapshot data and that's, it's fine. But no one wants to say, what if the SAN fails, right? So they always try to say, well, if the SAN fails, we'll have to go back to tape. Okay, so you're gonna wait for three days for the tape to come back while you repair the hardware and recover all the data and possibly rebuild servers, it becomes untenable. Um, and it becomes a very painful solution. And again, our IT guy is running around um, thinking that he's solved the pro problem when in fact, all he's done is delay the actual problem and only solve the subset of it. Uh, the, the third mistake I see a lot is partial versus full. So what they'll do is they'll come to me and they'll say, you know, we only need to recover these two servers if we have an outage because um, they're our most critical. The rest of them can wait. And while that's true um, for, for the short term, what you're going to find is if you actually do have a disaster, and I, and I say disaster in the sense of let's say your building caught on fire or you had a flood or something actual disaster, not just a server failure, um, you're going to find that the downtime without those uh, other servers, as you like to term them, um, becomes the critical path to your failure of a disaster recovery plan. And and it, the half is not the whole. Um, it, it really isn't, and you'll find you'll you, you you'll find that your customers um, will quickly, very quickly say, you know what, that's not acceptable. I need to be able, like for example, to have my BlackBerry server working, uh, a thing that no one in IT would deem as critical in this kind of event. You know, you would always say, I'm not worried about the BlackBerry server. If they can get it on their phone, they can log into their email, they can get up and running, they'll be fine. Uh, but you'll see how quickly that these these non-critical applications become critical. And if they weren't critical, you wouldn't even have them in your environment in the first place. Mistake number four that I see is, is um, mixing vendors, mixing products, mixing vendors. So most everybody nowadays has virtual servers. They have physical servers. They might have servers in the cloud running in Azure or AWS or VMware's cloud. Um, they'll have applications that are running on appliances and that kind of thing. Uh, they'll have 
basically a setup where they've set themselves up to have a different backup solution for every different application in their stack. And, and that becomes a nightmare in itself because, again, it's an overly complicated solution when you have to restore. Uh, when you have to recover everything, you'll find that going to 14 different places, trying to remember passwords, getting people involved, doing the right things, managing vendors uh, becomes a critical path, right? Having to call uh, one vendor for your remote data center, another vendor for your cloud applications, another vendor for um, anything uh, at a secondary site that you're going to be bringing up or going to uh, becomes a, a sense of of constant chasing yourself to try to get back up and running versus getting your servers back up and running and, and in production and resolved. And that should be your IT thing is, is to keep it simple and have a single, you know, a single throat to choke, so to speak. One person to go to, one way to get back up and running. And a lot of our vendors, um, a lot of our customers have so many vendors that over time they forget passwords or or they don't um, find themselves knowing which vendor does which thing. And, and, and um, it's, it's a painful experience. And I've watched, I've watched people go through it. Um, and I've gone through it myself in my distant past with, with some of the banks that wanted different solutions for different things. When they had to recover, it was, it was a days long process. Mistake number five is scalability. And this one, um, you, you never think about, uh, but people will plan a disaster recovery solution to last a year, but they only test once a year. So every year they have to upgrade their disaster recovery plan. And it's all in that, that same mold of, I want to save my costs, right? So they'll take the cheapest solution knowing full well that in a year they're going to have to upgrade it. They're going to have to change it. Um, and it's usually in today's day and age, it's a hard swap, right? They'll, they'll start out with a software-based solution running on their old hardware, but then their old hardware, uh, you know, Windows 2016 just came out. It doesn't support it. So they have to figure out what to go to, or they they find themselves in a situation where the application has changed and it doesn't support the old uh, standards that they were running on. And so every year they're constantly um, ch chasing themselves to upgrade this plan. And let's be honest, disaster recovery doesn't take priority over production environments, so sometimes it sits and then they go unprotected. Um, so scalability limitations and, and limiting yourself in that, in that solution uh, becomes, becomes a big problem for a lot of people, a lot of people. Um, so what do you do to mitigate that? How do, you, how do you really address these common mistakes? And I say them as common, and, and I'm sure that every one of you had at least one of those in your list that goes, yeah, I kind of do something like that. Um, you think you've mitigated it, but you, you can see where it could be a problem in the future. If not for you, if for, you know, who replaces you as you move on through your career path. Um, or you might have stepped into this IT position, replacing someone else, and find that what they've set up is totally inadequate. Um, the, the real way to do it is to keep things simple. Your disaster recovery plan should be able to be done by just about anybody in your company. And if you keep that mentality, you're going to have a much better chance of success. And when I say keep it simple, I really do mean it should be you click the button, you turn it on, and it works. Um, it, it, if it's overly complicated, if you have a 500-page binder of all the steps that you have to go through to recover, all you're doing is making it so nobody else can recover except for you which you might think is job security, but really it's, it's what I commonly find as managers go through when they have to fix something is what they look at first, is who, who's put themselves in a position where I can't get rid of them. That's my cause of failure. Uh, it has to be a dependable solution. It has to be testable and, and testable constantly, right? It can't just be a once a year DR test that you do a sub part of the entire DR plan. Um, you should be able to test uh, all of your applications and your stack every day, um, or at least on a on a regular basis, to give you that peace of mind that if you need it to work, it's going to work. Um, it should be comprehensive, without a doubt. It should cover everything. It should be able to cover your 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 NAS data, your server, your Windows servers, your Linux servers, 
um, your applications, your cloud servers, all of those should be able to be included in your solution, again, so that you're having minimal vendors to manage. Um, you're having the same process no matter what it is that you're recovering. Uh, so it's a repeatable process and it's easy to train on. Um, it, it should be able to be trainable to not just the IT staff, but you might have, uh, I don't know, if you're in a bank, you might have tellers at a branch that be, might be, might need to be able to turn on servers and get things started back up if you can't connect remotely or something like that. Those type of scenarios play out every single day and being able to put in a comprehensive solution to address that is critical. Um, I, I say unified here, uh, but what I really mean is, is, uh, is entire estate. So whether you're trying to recover a single file, a single server, an entire server, your entire server room, your entire data center. Um, it should be one unified way to go about it, one unified solution that, that covers all of these things because the more uh, straightforward and, and consistent you make your recovery process, the easier it's going to be when you get there. And of course, it should be robust, it should be scalable, it should be, if I need to, as I add applications or servers in my environment, I want to add extra storage or I want to add extra compute to my solution, um, I should be able to. And it shouldn't make it another more complicated solution for me to manage, it should be straightforward and it should be uh, quick and painless. And, and that's what every vendor should strive to provide in a DR plan. So let's talk a little bit about Quorum and how we kind of address these things. So what Quorum did is Quorum spun off from a military contract in the US that made software to go on naval vessels so that if one part of the vessel were, let's say, hit by a torpedo, it could react and transfer the functionality to different parts of the vessel to keep it running. And it was designed so that it could react faster than a human person could recognize what had happened and adjust. So it was all about uptime, it was all about recovery. And, and we took that same engine and we put it into the Onkey product that we sell commercially. And so what we do is we designed it from the ground up to be agnostic to your environment because we know your environment's gonna change over time. In fact, I, I, don't, I can't tell you how many customers I've seen that, that over the last five years have gone from physical to virtual running on VMware that are now coming back to me and saying, you know what, we're gonna, probably have to switch to Hyper-V because VMware is becoming too expensive or something along that lines. Um, I see it all the time. And because our product is designed to be agnostic to your environment, no matter how you grow and change over time, our product is, is ready for that adaptability. And so um, we back up at the Windows level, but at the sub-file level without having to rely on the block level that's what's underneath your hardware platform. So um, we back up as frequent as every 15 minutes. We leverage Microsoft VSS technology to snapshot the data so that we can quiesce your open databases and whatnot. Um, and then we take that data. Of course, we deduplicate it um, at the source and then across the appliance to give both levels of deduplication. And then we create a recovered virtual server inside the appliance so that if your server should crash, you can bring up the server in the appliance and instantly get back into the production point from your last snapshot point in time. And with those instant recovery servers, we have those for every snapshot you've saved. So let's imagine a scenario where you got ransomware or you got something that has infected your servers. Well, if you need to work your way backwards in time to find which server didn't have the ransomware, um, we have that capability to instantly boot each server in time until you find the one you need. Um, so it's very adaptable in that way as well. Uh, offsite replication, so our solution is designed to have something on site, be it an appliance or if you're a, a larger estate, we have a, what's called a pod or um, different kind of appliance realms and we'll go through that. But you would put something on site to act as high availability. So if I lost a single server or a single VMware host and I needed to bring up a bunch of virtual machines, um, I could locally. But then we take that data that's twice deduplicated, encrypted at rest, all that stuff, and we can replicate it off-site to either another appliance if you have a second location, or 
we have a UK based cloud here um, that you can put it in and we provide each customer with their own virtual firewall so that they can recover their entire site in the cloud and they're just a VPN connection away from resuming production. Uh, because we've built all these servers on the local appliance and in the cloud, we have an entire test environment that you can do for, well, really any testing that you want to do. So you could test applications, you could test patches, uh, you could run your DR test, which is our original design for, for it. Um, we can also automate those tests so each server can be tested every day to give you peace of mind that not only is Windows starting, which a lot of service providers will give you, hey, look, here's a boot screen, it started up, you're fine. Uh, we actually all take it a step further and we check to make sure that the services are starting, that, that I can talk from the OnQs interface through the IP interface to that server. So you know that not only does it have the right IP and the right connectivity, but that the stack is working. Um, to give you that peace of mind that when I need that server, it's going to be up and running. The OnQ itself is designed to hold between 30 and 40 days of retention of servers. But coming from a compliance background, we realized that there are some businesses that need to store years and years of data. And so we have a second virtual machine that we can install in extra storage that we can do archiving to card the archive vault. So we can archive snapshots to the archive vault to hold really indefinitely. Um, mostly we do about 10 years of archiving, but uh, we have customers that don't want to limit. So we can do indefinite archiving of data um, and just add storage as you need it. Uh, migration, again, I, I, I kind of mentioned this before, but we have customers that migrated from physical to virtual and then now they're going from VMware to Hyper-V or we're seeing some go to KVM. Um, they need a way to migrate their servers and because of the way we've designed ourselves to be agnostic, our backup and recovery feature work great in a migration project because we can just recover to the new platform, install drivers, and you're up and running. Last but not least is monitoring. Um, we keep a heartbeat with every server we protect. So not only are we backing it up and alerting on, you know, if you have a backup failure or anything like that, uh, we keep a heartbeat with that server. So if your exchange server goes down, we can actually send out an alert, which goes through what we call OnQ Central, which is our central database for alerts, and then it generates the email out to you. Now, the beauty is, let's say it is your Exchange server, you could actually set those alerts to go to a Gmail account or uh, to a text to your phone, and you can get those alerts and you can react, even though your Exchange server is what went down. So it's designed to be um, very redundant in that situation. Uh, a little bit about our architecture, um, and we kind of covered this verbally, but here's a picture to kind of diagram it out. Uh, the OnQ is designed to protect virtual machines, physical machines, and SAN or NAS data onto the OnQ appliance or set of appliances if you have more than one. We can then replicate that off-site to the cloud or to a remote site, which can create virtual machines and, and be able to recover any of those files or virtual machines uh, as needed. So. So even though I have an OR listed here for either either the OnQ cloud or a DR site, we can actually do a double hop too. We can go local appliance to a secondary site to the cloud or multiple sites into the cloud. Um, so there's lots of configuration opportunities to do this in any way, shape, or form. So uh, in December, we launched our new, um, our new version of the OnQ called 4.0. And when we did 4.0, uh, we took a tremendous amount of feedback from our customers on what they found and what they needed. And what we found was a consistent thing of they needed performance. So we looked at the marketplace and we realized that no backup vendor is really offering performance um, for those recovered servers. In fact, many will only give you an appliance that can run one recovered server. And even then it's on slow disk and it, it has trouble keeping up. So we we fully re-architected the OnQ on the back end to give this performance feature that you need. Um, and what we found is things like the hypervisor gets in the way of networking. You can only get about two gigs of, of data pushed through it when you go through the hypervisor layer because it's, it's basically using the CPU to do something that's not natural for a CPU, it's natural for your NIC controller to do. Um, and it's using software to do those things, which slow it down. And so we use SRIOV to pass data directly through a 10 gig network 
um, between virtual machines. So when we're updating a virtual machine and we're, we're talking to the virtual SAN, all of that goes through the 10 gig network. We also added a 400 gig NVMe cache um, inside the box that's also SRIOV connected to give you um, a much higher IOPS count than what you're getting with our other appliances to the extent that uh, we're now testing a fully NVMe appliance um, that could give somewhere in the in the range of six million IOPS. So we have the whole range of performance features covered in the new architecture. It also allows us to uh, quickly add storage. Um, we've added encryption at rest. We always had encryption in transit. Uh, we've added compression that gives us about 1.5 uh, in the compression ratio, which is great. Um, and then uh, the ability to have these RNs at any point in time. So we've really done a tremendous amount to put this architecture in a way that uh, really puts us in place to be a working architecture for you if you have an outage. Um, and and I'll, I'll give you an example. One of our customers is an insurance company and they have, I think they have around 10 pairs of appliances in their environment and they use 40% of, of their environment running in the test network at any given time for all the projects that they do internally. So they're always running on that test network and they needed that performance. Um, and, and what we found is a lot of our customers, while they don't buy it for the test network, find that test network invaluable and the performance in it valuable to use. And so building that, that capability in was critical for us. Uh, we also upgraded all of our uh, architecture to the latest Dell hardware. Um, right now we're on, on Dell 730s and 530 boxes, depending on the size that you need. We also have what's called the on pod, and I'll kind of hop into the next slide for this. So this is our kind of a main appliance range. And we start with uh, the 404 series, which is designed to be about five terabytes, uh, up to 10 terabytes of storage. And then we go into the 420 series, which has 22 to 32 terabytes, and the 424, which is 32 to 50 terabytes. Now that 32 to 50 terabytes is in a single 2U appliance. And it starts out with 256 gigs of memory, um, upgradable, and I think it has 14, two 14-core 14 processors in it. So plenty of, or I'm sorry, it has two 12-core processors in it. So plenty of processing capabilities in the appliance to handle really up to about 50 VMs. So if you kind of get a sense of, of where you're scaling, you can see that our, our products are designed not only to boot these servers up when you need them, but actually to run that stack when you need it to run. Uh, we've had customers that have lost their SAN due to firmware errors that took their SAN down for several weeks, and they ran off of the OnQ for several weeks without customer complaint because, or without end user complaint, because they had a solution that could keep up that performance. The next piece is our OnQ pod, and this is really designed to scale for our larger customers or our MSP providers that want to uh, kind of create their own clouds. And it's designed as a stack architecture, so the SAN is kept separate from the appliance, and then you have appliance heads so you can grow your compute and your storage completely separately uh, to scale for your needs. And so this goes anywhere from, I say 400 terabytes, but really it goes anywhere from uh, uh, 100 terabytes on up to to several hundred. Uh, I think our max right now that we sold is 800 terabytes in a single pod. So you can see that it's just designed to scale um, in any way, shape, or form to, to match with the needs of the customer. Okay, so I've kind of buzzed through a lot of this. Uh, before I go to Q&A, actually, um, I'm going to hop into a quick demo of the single OnQ interface so you guys can see um, what that, that looks like. So here I'm connected to my lab in California. And um, I have a single interface up here. I have three users, three servers installed. I have a CRM server running Microsoft SQL. I have a domain controller, and I have an Exchange server. You'll also note that I took the domain controller and the Exchange server, and I put them into a group that I call Exchange. And I did this so that if I have to start Exchange, I've set dependencies up so that it looks for the domain controller on the network first. If it doesn't find a domain controller, it starts the domain controller on the on queue, and then it starts the Exchange server, because starting the Exchange server isolated with no domain controller 
is useless because it won't start exchange. And so you can preset those dependencies so that when you need it to start, it's still one, put, one button to push. But today we're going to look at the CRM server. So if I flip over here to this screen, this is the web interface for that CRM server. and We're running a Sugar CRM with a SQL backend. And you can see it's up and running and doing its thing. What we're going to do is virtually yank the network cable out of this box. So I'm going to just deactivate the network cable there. And I'm going to hop back over to the interface. And if I, if I look here and I try to go somewhere else, you can see in the bottom corner, or you can see it's loading page, it's trying, it's trying. Eventually, it's going to fail. But what I want to do is show this to you there when it failed from the on -cue screen. And you can see that the connection status just turned red. If I had my phone volume on, you could hear that I just got an email letting me know that that server is down so that I can react and bring it back up. To bring it back up is a very straightforward process. Um, all you really do is hit the power button. It's going to come up and it's going to say, hey, do I want to start this box in the test network or in the production network? Now, remember how I talked earlier about that test network? You can do all your DR testing, patch testing, application testing without affecting production because it isolates it from your physical network on the back. But in this case, we're going to start it in production. It also asks me what snapshot I want to start. Now, obviously, it, it's preset to do the most recent snapshot. But as you can see, I can go backwards in time and pick any snapshot I want to start up. So we're going to start the most recent snapshot, and we're going to power it on. The next question it's going to ask me is if I want to disable backups. So this is an important question, because what we do is even if we're running on the recovered server, we still back it up, and we still replicate it off-site to give you that second level of failover capability. So even if you failed over locally, you still have a second hop that's still getting updated so that you're not at the end of your rope at that point. So we'll go ahead and leave backups enabled, and we will continue. And it's going to boot up that server. And that's how hard it is to start a server. It's really that simple. It lets me know it's firing up, and it's going to boot. So while I wait for it to boot, I'm going to show you a couple of other features of the OnQ. The first thing I'm going to show you is the restore capabilities. So if I was doing a file level recovery, I could just come in here, click on a snapshot. Um, it'll load up. You can see the C drive the D drive, whatever, and, and you pick your thing, and then you pick your destination where you're going to recover to. It's very straightforward, very easy to use. Um, we also have what's called the window share recovery. And what window share does is it actually creates a mountable point directly into the deduplicated data repository that I can map a drive to. And then when I go through the folder list and the file list, whenever I want to drag something back to my desktop or wherever I'm recovering to, it will actually recreate that from the deduplicated data on the fly back into recovery. And, and it can do this in a dynamic way that I don't even have to drag it back to recovery. I can just point at access that I need of it. So for example, if I needed to recover a, uh, a, a, an exchange server, I can do that very easily through this. In fact, we partnered with a company called Crow on Track to help recover exchange data so we can recover mail items, calendars, contacts, even to different versions of exchange um, with this product. So it's very easy and straightforward to use. The next thing is we have a snapshot. So when you're doing your BMR, so let's imagine a scenario where you failed over to the on queue and now you've repaired your local servers and you want to recover back to them. Well, with the on queue, if I had a three terabyte server, that copy time is going to be several hours. So I don't want my customers or my end users to be down for that copy time. So I can leave the recovery node running, do the three terabytes of data copy back from the previous snapshot, and then take a last snapshot, shut down my server on the recovery node, and just recover that last snapshot. So my actual downtime might only be 20 minutes that I can schedule and plan for because I'm running on the recovery node during the bulk of that time. The next thing we have is self-test. And you can see I don't have any self-test scheduled but it's very easy to schedule a self-test. You just pick the server, pick the time, and hit save. Very easy, straightforward to do. Now, every day at 1 o'clock in the morning, it's going to fire up this CRM server in the test network. It's going to make sure that it has network connectivity in the test network. It communicates with the on -queue. The services are running, Windows is running, and everything is up and ready to go. That gives me peace of mind that when I need that server to run in production, it will be ready.
Protection config is how you set up the box. Again, very simple process. If you're setting up a single server, you can just go to this web portal from that server and click the protect me button. Um, that will launch the agent and put it on the box. Um, really ideal for physical servers or Hyper-V. If you're running in a virtual environment, you can also do agentless. So you can pick your ES host, your vCenter, and deploy it that way. If you want to deploy to multiple boxes, you can actually pick your Windows domain controller. You can select all the servers that you want to deploy to, and you can deploy that way. So three ways to really deploy your agents or your agentless solution um, and get everything up and running very quickly. In any of those cases, what it's going to do when it deploys is it's going to scan the box and it's going to come back with a screen very similar to this where you're going to see, okay, I see one CPU, how much memory it has, all the drive letters, um, all the uh, virtual machines and everything that it needs to be up and running. Then you hit save and you're done. Um, you can set your schedule up here for when you want it to take backups, which days, and so forth and so on. If we come back to the dashboard, you can see that my connection status is back to green. It does let me know that I'm running on the recovery node because of the exclamation mark. And if I go back to this page and I just refresh the page, um, you'll see that I should be back up and running. There's the refresh button. There we go. I should be back up and running and connected. So that gives me... I don't know, two minutes while I did this to get back into that server uh, and get it up and running for my customer base versus trying to get tapes or uh, go through the 27-step procedure that you need to recover on different solutions. It was a couple of clicks and we were up and ready to go. So in, in total, it's a very simple, very straightforward, easy solution to use. Um, and, it, and it makes that recovery uh, I don't want to say mistake proof, but but uh, it mitigates a lot of the mistakes that people make with a recovery solution. So, uh, Lee, if you're still there, let's go to some questions and answers and see what um, what people are saying. Yeah, no, I'm uh, definitely uh, definitely here. Thank you very much, Dave. That was uh, that was a a cracking run through there, and uh, always good to see the uh, the solution in action at the end. Uh, so do like. So just a couple of questions that have come through. So uh, you mentioned about the the notifications um, uh, coming through if a server is unavailable, um, and they came through to you by email. Is that the only option for delivering those? Um, not technically, no. We can also do it via text messages, um, but most likely it's going to be uh, email. Uh, uh, based notification. Okay. Uh, and, no and in, um, certain in certain situations, we can also do SNMP alerting, um, but that's okay. on a case by case. We can turn that on and off. Excellent. No problems. Um, and another question that came in was um, uh, obviously you, you covered it a little bit there in the demo, but how long does it typically take to boot a uh, server um, as a recovery node? Um, is it comparable to the the live server, or is it and subject to the hardware that you've, you've chosen for the on -key. No, it's, it's pretty comparable to the live server. Um, in fact, not to, not to talk bad about my own company, but our Exchange server was running on really old hardware, and last, uh, about a month ago, it had a failure, and we had to fail over to our own on -key, and it, it actually runs faster on our on -key than it did on our old hardware. So, <laughs> <laughs> excellent. That's that's probably reassuring for a lot of people. Um, yeah. So that made me have to actually say, okay, I need to buy a new Exchange server. <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Um, another question. This literally just a second popped in with uh, from from John. Uh, would the four hundred four be considered a complete data backup and DR system in one? And any advantages over Unitrends? Uh, it would be a complete backup and 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 DR in one. Um, Advantages over unit trends are, are basically going to be exactly the things I've talked about. It's going to be our speed, our performance, uh, the fact that we, we work with you and size your solution. We're sizing it for your entire estate and for three years versus what I see often happen is, is undersizing for one year to get the deal done and then forcing an upgrade later. Yeah, okay, that's that's good. Hopefully, John, that's answered that one for you. Um, uh, another one that popped in was, uh, to do with the test network, um, are there any limitations on what you can do with running servers in that test network? Boy, if there are, I haven't found them. Um, we can do VLANs. We can set up to uh, a secondary port on the physical box to connect to, you know, a segmented port of your other networks. Um, there's nothing inside the box that would limit the VLANs at all. So it's pretty, 
it's pretty flexible and, and built to, to work for anybody. Yeah. Okay. No, that's, that, that's good. That's good to know. Um, well, that, that wraps up the Q&A. So um, if anyone else has got any questions, um, if you want to pop those through quickly, but um, whilst we just do, uh, do the last little bits. So, um, uh, so another question that was asked earlier on was, um, would we be able to distribute the slide deck? Um, um, I'll, I'll check with, uh, with Gabe afterwards, but um, we can say yeah, distribute to. this uh, some information uh, to everybody that was on the um, uh, the webinar um, uh, after the uh, after that. So, um, looks like the ah here we go. Um, question from Barbara: uh, Can you help with uh, voice over IP recovery? Um, in most cases, it depends on what your platform is for your voice over IP. Um, if it's running on a Red Hat kernel of Linux like uh, Cisco's does, or if it's running on a Windows box, absolutely. Um, if you're running something like Shortail, which is running on an appliance, it becomes more difficult because we're not obviously putting analog ports in and that kind of stuff. We could probably do the management server, but the actual voice over IP switch might be a little more complicated. Yeah. Okay. That makes uh, that, that makes sense. Um, okay. Cool. Um, well, as we've not got any more questions uh, coming through, um, this leads me to wrap up. Really. So this has been recorded. So um, I will pop a link out to people um, if you're interested, so you can watch it back. Um, uh, obviously, any questions that you think of after the event, do please um, drop us a line. Um, I myself or Gabe would be more than happy. Uh, to answer those for you and uh, we uh, we hope you've enjoyed this and thank you very much for your time look forward to catching up with you again thanks a lot everybody